cello is one of my favorite instruments, but I have to tell you a story about it. I uh, went to the University of Georgia on a music scholarship, and uh, it was in the early classes where I was having to learn to play the cello, and I couldn't do it. I changed my major to philosophy. <laughs> but I love the cello, and I thank them for, for playing this morning and for Pam accompanying them. I think I said this once before. At my age, sometimes you do those things. Someone has said, it was actually Don Marquis to give you a specific name. If you make people think they're thinking, they will love you. If you make people think, they may hate you. And I want to make you think, but I don't want you to hate me because I want to have a good relationship with you, but I do want to encourage you to think a little bit. And before I read the scripture this morning, I want to uh, ask you a couple of questions <clears throat> to let you know where I'm coming from, why this passage of scripture, and how it might touch your life, hopefully. This has been a very, this past week, or actually the past two weeks, have been two very suspenseful weeks, to say the least. I don't know what you've thought about during the past week about the things that are going on in our world. Several things have gone through my mind as I listen to the news and read, listen and read about the news try to understand what's going on. And it had particular interest as I was preparing our, for this message today from Second Peter. Periodically, I will take the time to make a list of things that are going on in our world internationally, nationally, and locally. And I'll make a list of those things that I think as a Christian, I should be aware of and things that I should really be praying about as far as our world is concerned. And when I make that list, I usually list things that are positive and good to thank the Lord for. And then I list things that may be negative and uh, not as good. But I want to tell you, as I've been doing that recently, I haven't been encouraged. I haven't been able to single out the positive things that will balance off <laughs> the negative things. I, I, I think, about, think about the terrorism in the world that's going on everywhere that's continually keeping us off balance, not only as our nation, but other nations as well, claiming many lives in, in the process of demonstrating their terrorism. I think about the mass starvation in South Africa. I think of tragedy after tragedy that we hear about in the daily news. Leaders being overthrown only to be replaced by more extremist leaders, and I think of Egypt as probably the most present example. North Korea, Iran, Syria, Egypt, Afghanistan, they are virtual powder kegs right now. And we can only guess what the fallout is going to be as a result of our being backed into a corner over the present Syrian crisis. You've been hearing about it on the news. We may end up supporting those who ultimately would like to see the United States destroyed.
chemical and biological warfare is an imminent threat in our world. Nuclear explosives, they're, they're no longer science fiction. And as we realize that there are nuclear explosives in the hands of evil, wicked, godless people, I think of Iran and its nuke arsenal as we, we hear about. Who knows what could happen there? And of course, there's global economics and euro economics that are impacting our own economy in America. And, and here we are building more reliance on China as a nation when China is not that quick to befriend us as a nation. I think about the questionable relationships between us and Russia right now and the tension between our president and their president. I think of the massive influx of Muslims into the major cities throughout Europe. And what that's causing in those cities is they bring with them their Islamic extremism and focusing on Sharia law. And just this past week I had a conversation with a friend of ours who has been a missionary to the Muslims in another country, but for the last two years, they've been here in the Atlanta area working and ministering to the, to the Muslim community. And that reminded me that that global challenge is right here in our own city. And then on my national list, I think about the critical unemployment, people losing their homes, people losing their jobs, people removing themselves from the job force, which is messing up our understanding of the unemployment. I, I, there's no bright picture for us right now as a nation economically, especially as health care is going in a direction we know not where. We just heard on the news this week that as of October the 1st, the price of insurance could double and triple and quadruple. A little over two and a half years ago, a super committee was put together, made up of some of America's finest, and they could not come up with a solution to some of the problems that, that we're facing. And I thought of a little history. Back in 1977, when Congress approved the Community Reinvestment Act, Jimmy Carter was president then. That's the basic act of Congress that provided the energy that has fed the recent collapse in the housing industry. It was a failure. And yet, there's still talk on the news, I'm sure you've heard it, of reenacting that CRA. <laughs> Our political scene is a disaster in America. I have never seen a, our country in all my years as divided as we are today. Our jails and our prisons are so overcrowded that criminals are having to be released because of lack of space for them in those institutions. The government continuing to usurp the role of religion in the area of morality, doing things, making decisions that I believe, from my understanding of the word, are an abomination to the Lord and to his people. Redefining families redefining sex roles and so on. Even though God's law word is clear about those very things. Do you know what I thought as I was praying through this this week and feeling down and depressed and wanting to be encouraged? It's almost like it was in the days of the judges. When everyone did what was right in his own eyes, but I thought, no. The difference is today, we don't even have that sense of what is right. 
and what is wrong because it's so postmodern or so subjective in how we define those things. So as I was doing that exercise and, and not, not feeling very up, uplifted, getting more and more depressed, I was reading from the scripture asking God to give me his perspective that I and, and other Christians ought to have as we look at these kind of things that are going on in our world today. And I tell you, in doing that, I was mentally, physically, and spiritually exhausted through that process. However, God, who orchestrates all things that come to pass, spoke to me in this passage of Scripture that I'm about to read. And I said, God, give me the right perspective on these things that I'm so burdened about. Help me to know what I as a Christian should be doing and encouraging other Christians to do. Help me to fix myself on you, Lord. Because it's only as God is on the throne, and we know that, that we can hope to make any sense out of some of this senseless, evil, wicked things that are going on in our world today. And you know, this passage of Scripture became very dear to me these past couple of weeks. Just as the Bible says, the Word is profitable for instruction, for correction, for walking in righteousness of life. So with that background, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Peter 3. I'm going to read the entire chapter. In your bulletin it says Romans, but the text is correct. But we pick up at the eighth verse in the bulletin. I want to start at the first verse of the third chapter of 2 Peter. Hear the word of the Lord. This is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the Holy Lord, of the Holy Prophets, and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on the earth will be exposed. And since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since we are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. 
just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of the lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and to the day of eternity. Amen. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Let me give you a background for this passage. That's the way we, by the way, you should always read scripture. You need to read it in its context, first of all, in order to understand something of the background. Second, Peter is a very powerful epistle in the New Testament. It's very much like the little epistle of Jude. And some say it's hard to know whether Jude had read Peter before he wrote or whether Peter had read Jude because they're talking about similar things. And what Peter is doing in this context is challenging the people in in that environment to build their lives upon the true knowledge of God. And he said, you do this by making your calling and election sure. How? By adding to your faith knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Clearly, our effectiveness and our fruitfulness will hinge on those very qualities in our life. As a matter of fact, our entrance into the kingdom of heaven will hinge on having those characteristics or qualities of life. Now, why would Peter say that? Uh, after all, I thought, I thought my entrance to heaven was based solely on Christ. Well, all I can tell you and all we can see is what Peter said. And remember that he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So to understand, we have to back up and try to connect some dots in order to help us begin to make some sense out of some of the senseless, irrational, bad things that are happening in our world. In other words, we need a philosophy of life, one that will help us know how to see life, how to interpret life and reality from God's perspective. And he's given us his word in spirit to lead us through that process. Now, while everyone, bar none, have a worldview which colors their understanding of reality, not everyone has a Christian worldview. One that starts with the truth of God, that he is the creator and the author of all things. Peter said he created by the word of God. He alone is the creator of the world. And that includes man created in his image. You and I are created in the image and likeness of God. So when God created the world, he then created humankind. Adam was the first man. Adam was made to serve God and to do God's command. And we know the story. He disobeyed God. He didn't follow God's word, and he fell into sin, and sin began to influence not only Adam's life and his posterity later, but physical creation itself. But realizing that God, in creating the world, had more in store than simply the fall into sin and the influence of sin, he sent his son Jesus, the second Adam, to die on the cross, to sacrifice himself, to become the atoning, the atonement for our sins, 
that the fall into sin had brought upon us. So there we have the first three foundation blocks in a Christian world and life view. Creation, the fall, and redemption. Creation, the fall, and redemption. These are the basic truths that undergird a Christian world and life view. To those, we must add that while Christ accomplished our redemption by paying for our sins upon the cross, by dying in our place and taking the wrath of God upon himself, he is now by his spirit in the process of restoring us into the likeness and image of Christ. As we await the final consummation, Christ's second coming. So there you have the other two points of a Christian worldview. Restoration and consummation. So let's review. Creation, the fall, redemption, restoration, and consummation. That's what undergirds and makes what we call the Christian world and life view. You see, if we understand this, we realize that there's no area of our lives over which Christ has not said mine. There is no part of our life which we call the sacred and a part that we call the secular. It's all one before God. And we need that perspective as we try to understand life and reality. Well, as I I looked at these events that were on my list, and reading this passage of Scripture, I was reminded that being a Christian is more than reading the Bible. It's more than coming to church. It's more than praying. It's more than witnessing. Of course, the Christian life is all those things, but in reality, the Christian life is a way of life. It is a way of thinking. Because as a man thinks in his heart, the proverb says, so is he. And we need to understand that. If we don't understand that spending time with our family, repairing a leaky faucet, buying groceries, going to school, studying for an exam, or being faithful as we fill out our our income tax, are all part of our Christian world and life view. We have not fully understood the perspective of what Christianity is really all about. We'll come back to this. Now, let me tell you about the audience that Peter, to whom Peter is writing. Who were the recipients of this epistle? They were people who found themselves among false teachers, among those who were teaching things that contradicted the Word of God, people that were challenging that Christian world and life view and making fun of it and causing, calling it silly. They were people who were blaspheming against God. As Peter says, They were living sensual lives, greedy lives, ungodly lives. They were denying God. And Peter said, I want you to understand that these false teachers are among you and they will confuse you by their wrong teaching. And if you listen to them and you follow them, you will follow them right to your condemnation And you will be destroyed, as were the people in Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed for their ungodly living. And that's a reference to Genesis 13, and Peter quotes that in this passage. And along with describing the false teachers that his audience was exposed to, he said they were bold and willful in their blasphemy against God. He calls them, in the second chapter, he calls them ignorant animals. 
with eyes full of adultery and an insatiable appetite for sin. They even loved the rewards they got for their evil doing. They offered freedom while they themselves were enslaved to sin and corruption. Peter said they knew the truth. And yet they blasphemed against it. And he said it would have been better for them not to have known the truth than to have known it and turned away from it. What were they teaching? Well, they were teaching things like this physical earth and world are not real. And they're going to be destroyed. They were teaching things like the body is the prison house of the soul as Plato, the philosopher, uh, taught. And that at one point, this body is going to die and destruct and our soul will, will go somewhere. They weren't sure, weren't sure where. They were teaching wrong things. And false teaching, and Joseph mentioned this this morning, has a way of helping us misunderstand Scripture and misinterpret things. For example, they would take a passage out of the Scripture like, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And they would say, you see, that's what the Bible says. So we need to turn away from this physical world. There's nothing good about it. Peter corrects that kind of thinking. That's wrong. Another thing they were saying was in death, our, our soul will go to heaven. Our body will self-destruct and we will be dis, disembodied spirits throughout all, all eternity. They were saying, Look, this Jesus said he was coming back. Where is he? We don't see him. Recently I was reading an online magazine called Newsmax and there was a story with that same title. Will Jesus ever return? Well, Peter wanted his audience to know the truth and to live accordingly. I want us to know the truth. And I want us to live accordingly. And Here's the truth. Our view, our thoughts about the end will profoundly influence our life at the present. Now with that in mind, let's jump into chapter 3. Peter wrote, I want you to know the truth, including what awaits the wicked who deny God the Creator and his plan of restoration for his creation. I don't want you to listen to them. I don't want you to pay attention to them speaking against the Christian worldview because, as I said, that would only lead to your condemnation as well as theirs. What Peter is doing in this third chapter is basically setting things straight about life, metaphysically and ontologically. The Gnostic teachers of that time were wrong in what they were saying. And Peter said they must not be allowed to influence your life. They were saying things like, things will not always be as they appear to be right now. Peter said, I want you to know the truth about that. He tells us how things will be. And he tells us not only how things will be, but he tells us how we can live a life that will please God. In other words, I think in 2 Peter 3, Peter is giving us a perspective, a Christian perspective, that will help us know how to respond to some of the things that I mentioned uh, in my introduction. And he does this by reminding us that we must Keep God's perspective before us. He does that by quoting the psalm. For a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That's God's perspective. Peter wants us to live with God's perspective. Of course, he was countering and saying that, the teaching of the Gnostics, who were sarcastically saying, 
Where is this Jesus? Will he ever return as he said he would? He's lied. He hasn't kept his promise. Well, Peter says, yes, he will. That day is coming. But in the meantime, God wants you to take heart in how you live your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Some have tried to read this passage of Scripture where Peter talks about how he wants us to live our life, that he's confusing God's grace with works. And that we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Peter's not doing that. He's keeping things in perspective. Grace produces, real grace produces in us the kind of life that God would have us to live. He wants us to remember every day who we are. We're God's people. In God, we have our identity. We talked about that in a couple of previous sermons. There are those Christians, as you know, who try to embrace what we would call an easy believism. <laughs> that all you got to do is believe in Jesus and everything's okay. Well, that's not what Peter says. I, I like the way the footnote in the Reformation Study Bible puts it. It says, what we do <laughs> matters. And it does make a difference. We need to realize that we need to be constantly on guard and challenged to live the kind of life that God would have us to live. Now it is true that once God begins a good work in us, he will perform it to the day of Christ Jesus. He will preserve his children. But it's also true that his children have responsibility in that process as well. And how Peter deals with this is it, really interesting. He said, we need to live every day with the hope of the new heavens and the new earth. We need to believe right now that we are already embryonically a part of that new heaven and new earth which will come when Christ returns. And he gives us the formula for how to do that. The hope for better things, the joys, the benefits, the blessings of the anticipated future somehow are tied up with how we live our lives every day. How we act, how we react, how we proact, and how we treat one another. The American historian Martin Marty sarcastically said one and speaking to a group of evangelicals. He said, you talk about being born again? That took about 15 minutes. But now what? Now I ask you, do you think that being a Christian is easy? The Christian life is really a high maintenance way of life. We have to do the works of him who sent us. If his grace has taken over our lives, it requires that we work that out in our relationships every day. And remember, Peter was saying this to people who were being exposed to persecution, slander, false teachings, and all kinds of distress. One thing to be a Christian in the family, but this audience was being persecuted and ridiculed and spoken against and so on. Peter said, I want you to know that when you live by the commandments of the Lord, God is pleased. When you do not live by his commandments and word, he is very displeased. So here's the crux of what Peter wants us to see, I believe. He wants us to keep things in focus. 
And, and I want you to leave here this morning with the assurance that, that you have things in focus. That you have things looking at things from God's perspective. Now, don't get that wrong. That doesn't mean you'll leave here without any problems. Or it'll be easy for, for you from here on. No, it will not. But it will help you keep God's perspective before you. So here's the truth. When we start with God, we are able to set the priorities for our life and the things that we ought to be thinking about and concentrating on and doing. And if we try to understand it, everything like the events that I mentioned earlier as though that's all there is to, to this creation will never make any sense out of it. But God wants us to live with what Peter would call eschatological hope. He wants us to live daily remembering that, that the Lord is coming. That evil will be destroyed. That those who blaspheme against God will be condemned. He wants us to know that no matter what happens in our life, be it famine, war, the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, will not keep God's plan from being fulfilled. Peter says, therefore, we would do well to live a godly life. Because if we will, God will bless us in the midst of all of this, this stuff going on. And one other thing I want you to see in this passage of Scripture to underscore the importance of our living a godly and holy life. He says, we don't know when the day of Christ is coming. Only God knows that. It will come as a thief in the night, but it will happen. But then he says something very unusual in verse 10, and then something else in verse 12 that I want to call to your attention. He says that Christ, before Christ returns, every person for whom Christ died on the cross will be saved will come to repentance because he's not willing for any of his elect not to come to repentance and faith. So we know that. We know that before Christ returns, every person for whom Jesus died will be saved. The second thing he says in verse 12 Living a godly and holy life, a spotless life and without blame, is not just about us and our own spiritual formation. It has something to do with the return of Christ. So you know what Peter's saying? Only God knows when Christ is going to return. He gives us some clues to look for. But he also says that you and I can make a difference as to when that day will come. We do that by sharing the gospel so that people can come to saving faith and repentance of sin. And we do that by living godly and holy lives. We can actually, Peter said, hasten the day of the Lord by those two things. But think about the opposite. If we don't witness, if we don't share the gospel, if, if we don't introduce people to Christ, if we don't focus on living godly and holy lives, we can actually delay that day's coming and all the evil things that are going on will continue going on. I want you to understand what I'm saying is very today. Yesterday, when I was reading the Wall Street Journal, I read an interesting story called A Brief History of the Best Seller. You'll know the name. It was written by Stephen Hawking back in 19, 
88 and I think published in 1990, I think. Hawking, the, the scientist and mathematician who taught at Cambridge, was teaching the same kind of stuff that these false teachers, the Gnostics, were teaching about the world. He said, the world didn't have a beginning, it's not going to have an end, it just is. If we understand that, we have a unifying principle, namely God, who keeps things together. It's not our view of God, of course. This kind of thing is going on today. Not only in the events I mentioned, but in the false teachings that are abroad. So we, we, we don't have to take Christianity seriously. It doesn't matter how we live. We're going to be saved. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Now, here are five bullets that I want you to take home with you because I want you to have God's perspective. I want you to look at life through the lens of a Christian world and life view. So here are five things that I would suggest to you. First of all, seek to develop a Christian mind. You do that by studying the Word. You do that by constantly exposing yourself to the means of grace from the church which Paul calls the ground and pillar of truth. And it is true that developing a Christian mind changes the way we think and the way we live. So that's number one. Number two, be regular in prayer and attendance. Remember, it's not just about you and me. You can study the Word of God you can seek to have a Christian influence on the world about you. Do that. Three, if you're parents, you can be intentional in discipling your children and helping them to know who they are in the image of God in Christ and know how to think biblically and critically about things going on in the world. And you can do that by teaching them in the home, by bringing them to church and to Sunday school where the word is taught. Fourth, you can put off all unrighteousness, even the appearance of it, and concentrate on living your life holy for the Lord, which means seeing everything you do as being done unto the Lord. You remember Paul's words? Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all in the name of it to the glory of God. Make that your motto, to the glory of God. That's what my life is all about. And last, when your feet touch the floor every morning, realize that God is giving you another day to serve his purpose to this generation. You see, you and I are here on a mission. We are part of God's work. And as we develop in our godliness and holiness of life, He will be pleased to use us to make a difference in the world around us. That's what I mean by having His perspective, having His priority, having focus in your life. But Peter's last words, and by the way, uh, this passage of Scripture should really be four sermons. I'm trying to give you an overview. Peter's last words is live every day knowing that Christ is going to return. Because in doing that, you will be encouraged to witness for him and to live a godly and holy life. That's how we deal with these things by having God's focus. He doesn't tell us to forget what's going on in the world. But realizing what's going on, he says, here's some things you can do about it. And that's the hope that Peter gives us. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you today that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. We thank you that he's paid the price for our sins. We thank you for his promise that he's going to come back and he's going to take us to be with him in the new heavens and the new earth where sin will be no more. 
Father, living in the midst of the sinful, evil, wicked world, we long for that day when we can be, as Peter says, at peace forevermore. But help us right now to begin to experience that kind of peace and joy as we remember who we are, why we are, and why we're here. Our life belongs to you, O Lord. It's not ours. We're only here all along. So we pray that we'll live it to the fullest, to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.